welcome and good afternoon to all of you. I'm Umakan Soni. I'm co-founder and CEO of Art Park. Art Park stands for AI and Robotics Technology Park that we set up with a um, seed grant from Government of India, Department of Science and Technology and Government of Karnataka to the tune of 230 crores. And it is, uh, it is enabled to uh, take India into the so-called AI age. Uh, and the idea is to actually bring industry, academia, and government together to solve large problems with AI. What I'm actually going to present is um, as an interesting perspective. And of course, when people talk about artificial intelligence and you know the first thing they talk about is livelihood, right? Jobs ka kya hoga, right? So I'll try to address that in this question, but I would like to start uh, you know, this session with an interesting picture. And how many of you have seen this movie? Please raise your hand. This is another thing that I learned in ID Kardenpur, right? You need to start a lecture with a quiz. Then everybody's attentive. So only three people, okay. So if you haven't seen this movie, please go ahead and see this movie. Uh, it's called Blade Runner 2049, right? And we are at the 75th year and maybe by 100th year, we would be at 2047. So it's gonna be pretty near by that. So it's a very interesting movie about choices that we make and what could be the consequences of choices. And um, I, I took my wife to see this movie and you know, it was the last show. And, uh, you know, it was so depressing and dark uh, in some ways. In some ways, it was actually very uh, interesting as well. I think it's one of the best sequels that I've seen of a Hollywood movie. I mean, that's saying a lot. Um, uh, but it was really dystopian and disturbing for her. And she said that, you know, I need to watch some current your movies after this. <laughs> but it's, it's truly about these choices, I mean, that we are making today and how it will play out. And it's very important that we think through those choices because if I see and look at where we are, okay, fundamentally there are three major, uh, you know, paths that we can take. One could be the path that in US, you know, people are taking where you have for-profit, really large monopolies, right, which are working their way, they're opening the doors in AI in some sense. But as we know, you know, those could be very challenging at times because for-profit organizations means that the objective function is always profit. Right. So AI could develop in a way which could totally ignore humanity. Right. Then there is the China way where, you know, you might have uh, autonomous machines in charge of semi autonomous people, which could also be very disturbing. Right. At times, that's where it's important that in India, we think about the third path where machines and human beings can coexist in a synergistic way. And that is where we have been trying to focus our work on and would love to get your feedback and advice on how we're going about it. Uh, this is a quick bit about me. I've almost close to 21 years of making errors, uh, building technology, products, strategy, investing, entrepreneurship and policy. So the good part is that, that I'm good at nothing. I mean, in, in terms of an expert in all of them, but I do have some experience and exposure to, uh, because when you make errors in uh, lots of errors in one area, you sort of become an expert, right? So, so yeah, so we are, but a sum of all our errors. And uh, in fact, this is the thing that we are seeing when we are trying to develop AI, the, the more errors they make and the faster they make, you know, they will learn uh, and they become actually more efficient, capable much earlier. And that's why I have two kids and I, every time I'm reminded of correcting them, uh, I actually step back. Uh, because I see that they're making errors and they're learning, right? So errors are nothing but, uh, you know, learning opportunities. Uh, so if you're not making enough errors, you should talk to yourself because you might get outdated. So this is very interesting. You know, next, uh, you know, 20 to uh, 15 to 20 years are going to be very, very interesting. We're going to meet with what we call as um, uh, computing explosion with demographic dividend. It's a very pivotal opportunity if you were to ask me. What does it mean? It means that on one side, you know, the computing is becoming, so software is eating the world, right? It's going to be literally embedded in everything, right? So if, if I look back and see uh, the impact that it will have, uh, which practically means that by 2030 or 2035, we will have five or six billion people which are intelligent, which are connected, further connected with 50 billion devices, which are intelligent themselves. So together they will form 
a kind of an interesting uh, economy that we call it experience economy, right? So if I look back, right, uh, industrial economy was all about selling excess production of one place to another place, right? And by 1975, we had connected up to a billion places by rail, by road, uh, by flight, and, you, and that's how the multinationals got born, right? By 2005, we had connected half a billion people with internet, with email, and the social media was just coming up, right? And you could sell the excess knowledge of one person to another or one corporation to another. And that's how the knowledge economy was born, right? 2030, we're gonna have 5 billion people connected with 50 billion devices. And that is going to be what we call as AI-driven experience economy. And that, that is a very interesting age that's gonna be there because 90% of the value is going to be in so-called digital intelligent intangibles. So if you see on the left side, that complex chart that you see, it needs AI to get deciphered, So, but, but I'll help you there. So the red portion is the tangible assets, right? Anything you touch and feel, this, this, it's all tangible assets, right? The blue ones are the intangible ones, right? Which you can't touch and feel, right? And you can see the growth of the intangible assets, right? So as you see the changes in economy from 1975 to 2005 and further down the line, it's going to be, the intangible assets are going to be almost, you know, they will be capturing most amount of value, right? And whatever will be tangible will get automated to a large extent. So the human creativity and innovation and the future jobs are going to be lying in that part, right? Which we call as digital intelligent intangibles. It will lie in personalization. So it is going to create, you know, $15.7 trillion of new economic value. It's a massive number, you know, where are we right now? It's at what, three, three trillion or so? So it's almost like five, you know, 5.2, 5.3 times. So there's a massive opportunity that's out there, right? And of course, AI is now getting into not just in Hollywood, but also Bollywood and Collywood. So it's pretty much there. But so let's let's look at it like where it is right now, right? And you know, a lot of you might have seen this uh, video that actually exploded. Can you increase the song? Yeah, let's enjoy the music. Okay, we can't, we can't have too many robots dancing. But yeah, this was an interesting video and I think a lot of you might have seen it on your Twitter feeds or, you know, Facebook, Insta, right? And it talked about these robots which are dancing and it was very interesting because, you know, dancing is a very human emotion, right? And seeing a robot dance to that was, you know, uh, to some people like me, it was very exciting because I could see the technology challenges that they are going past. But a lot of people is like, okay, you know, they, they dance better than us. And uh, yeah, I mean, like, you know, they might be employed, uh, you know, Bangla dancers, which are robots in the, you know, so, so that could be a tricky part, right? Like DJs are already there. Uh, you know, they might be dancing, so the, the robots might be dancing to, uh, you know, you might be hiring robots to dance at your party or your, Shadi and all that, right? So it's a very interesting and at the same time, to some people, it's a different concept. Uh, but yes, we have human parity for, you know, speech and uh, image recognition. So AI can recognize your wife better than you can. And that's the reality. Um, or girlfriend or boyfriend, I mean, uh, I'm just, I just want to be make sure that I cover everything. But uh, let, let's look at it more deeply, right? Like, so this is, uh, I'll try to. So you saw the dancing one, then you look at the acrobatic one. After that, I start going to gym for a while. I'm like, I can never do parkour like that. Yeah, you look at the balance, uh, you know, look at the neat way it is efficiently utilizing the space, calculating those, you know, millions of, uh, billions of uh, computation in his mind. And it's, it's fun, it's fun. It's fun to look that, look at them. I could look at them all the day while not going to gym, which may not go down well, but, but here's the reality. Okay. You felt bad, right? Whether it's human or <laughs> machine, you feel that emotion, right? That's hard to, it's hard to recreate that empathy. The reason I wanted to show you was that, you know, that empathy, is what makes us human beings. And we don't know how to put that inside machines yet. I think it's gonna be 
uh, for the next foreseeable future to be hard to do that. And you see them, some of them actually fall down and some of them succeed. Uh, and it's very human. So, so I see that, you know, machines are becoming more like human beings. And of course, human beings are becoming more like machines. And unfortunately, I think machines will surprise us. They will tell us what is uniquely human about ourselves. It's, it's going to make us question what, you know, truly a human, I mean, human being is, right? What it means to be a human being. And that's a thought that I would actually love for you to ask yourself. How many of you have heard about Dali? Yeah. Okay, the, the artist? Okay, so there is an AI program which can generate very, you know, interesting images similar to the style. And, uh, you know, when I saw it, I, I tried to paint and I went once went to uh, one of the, uh, you know, the, 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 the French galleries and I asked them that, you know, what I paint when it will be valuable. And they said that after you die, which is true, by the way, like, you know, <laughs> but it was still, you know, a shock to hear that. Uh, so, so when I saw that, you know, the, the DALI uh, program, which was generating these interesting images. Um, of course, I felt it is like a, okay, it could be like a competition or, you know, I felt like, okay, my gosh, I wasted so many years, but it was interesting because, you know, when you start to paint then you realize and appreciate art a lot more because you know, the difficulty that goes behind it. But when we exposed it to kids and, you know, this is an interesting video about that, you know, how they exposed it to kids, your kids came up with some really fascinating way to explore that they used it as a ladder to their imagination. And, uh, you know, I know, um, uh, uh, Steve Jobs once talked about, you know, computer being a cycle for the mind. And, but if you look at AI, it, it's, it's kind of like, you know, the, the turbo booster for the cycle, right? This is very interesting because you can see the kids, uh, you know, they're talking about like, you know, uh, <clears throat> so they basically put in some interesting comments and Dali generates the images, right? And and look at the kind of imagination that they are coming up with because they could experiment with it, right? It's it's almost like when you actually got the digital camera, you could finally learn photography, right? Because you could experiment so much. And of course, you could post it on Instagram and get weird comments and, and that actually allows you to improve further or maybe, you know, allows you to post certain kind of, uh, you know, photographs on that. But it's actually interesting, um, you know, to have, uh, you know, those, uh, you know, things coming up as almost like a ladder to the imagination to go further than where they could have gone by themselves. And uh, so it's interesting to see, you know, the kind of images that, you know, kids came up with and what kind of usage they had. So, so while AI is, is actually, you know, going further, it's pushing us in so many ways. Uh, it's pushing us to embrace humanity. It's pushing us to look inside us. I mean, I invested in a company uh, called Vaisa, uh, uh, which is a English, uh, you know, <laughs> name for uh, Rishi Vyas. I mean, they, they pronounce it like that. Um, and it's a, it's a mental health chatbot. And during COVID times, it just blew up uh, 480 million conversations on the platform. And it's very interesting at four o'clock in the night when you, when you are uh, depressed, you have anxiety because of COVID, whom do you talk to, right? And people found that, okay, they could talk to a chatbot. And it also says a lot about us, the state of society we are in. So that is actually interesting that it's pushing us in so many ways. Now, uh, if I look at where, uh, you know, AI, of course, AI is used as a very broad term. But if I have to distill it down and look at in terms of images, uh, you know, waves, uh, what are the major waves in AI? And I was just trying to simplify it. And I know it's not a technical audience, but so the wave one was where you actually were using handcrafted machine learning systems. Uh, the wave two was, uh, you know, the, the deep learning revolution that came up. Wave three is where you are actually having these uh, common sense adaptations. So you teach them to do one thing, but then they also learn by themselves to do other things. And it's very interesting. One of my good friend and, uh, you know, co-founder in uh, AI Foundry uh, is a professor at CSAIL and his group built this interesting robot. And you might have seen this, you know, this is a, fastest going cheetah so you can see how fast it is running right and it's interesting because when you run you know everything you know their hardware configuration is changing so ai is optimizing that and of course this is a simple thing to do using you know getting these machines to do is kind of interesting uh, the different terrain on which it is going right 
it is adopting to it in real time, right? So it's being trained on one terrain, but then it can hop on to another terrain and not fall. Uh, so you can see, you know, how it is trying to turn around in a gravel, which is hard. Then, uh, you know, it could go into new uh, places and you can see the difference between when you design it with human intention versus, so it's not able to go there, but machines by self-learning, they're able to go there and adopt to it, right? So this is the third wave of AI that we are actually getting into. And it's kind of very interesting because it will actually allow machines to have new kind of capabilities. And that also represents us with choices. So if I take a look at the impact that these three waves of AI so far have, I mean, the fourth wave we don't know, right? You know, of course, the, the Hollywood and the Bollywood movies and the Hollywood movies keep saying that it is here, but it's like quite far away, like maybe 50, 60 years. We haven't invented the technique which would probably get us there. But what I see is that the near term, we are actually having these interesting devices, uh, interesting uh, AI, which is allowing us to act as a superhuman, right? And when I act as superhuman, it's not about flying and I mean, things like that yet, but it's about a nurse who could actually help the patient diagnose something, right? Or you could self-diagnose, or you could self-screen yourself, uh, you could self-help yourself, right? So it allows you to rise above your own capabilities in some sense, right? Uh, so this is an interesting company that I invested in. So they actually came up with a way to uh, uh, screen uh, uh, breast cancer really early because breast cancer is pretty deadly in India, right? If you get identified with breast cancer, two out of one woman dies as compared to one in six in US and Europe because we don't screen enough, right? Women, most of the time, the radiologist is male. And uh, because of social reasons, it is very uncomfortable for women in India to go and screen themselves. But with this approach, where nobody touches you, nobody sees you, uh, they actually found that woman actually had a comfort factor. By the way, this is one of the first AI startups to get FDA and C certified. They have 12 published global patents. And uh, not only in India, they're going live in uh, US and Europe as well. So it's very interesting that this kind of startup is uh, coming up there. Uh, so in the first wave, in the near term, we're going to have this superhuman, right? So the intelligent augmentation uh, is going and is going to allow us to, you know, kind of like punch above our weight in some sense. The second one is going to be harder to imagine right now, but because I talked about the 90% value creation is going to happen in this, you know, digital intelligent intangibles, which is about personalization at scale, you know, uh, you're going to actually have more jobs. So if I see this, right, I mean, uh, the way uh, Uber or Ola allocate jobs to uh, drivers, right? So you know when the car is empty versus when the car is not, right? Just this determination of uh, the, the asset factor allows them to multiply the savings that each driver make, was making earlier, right? So earlier, each driver was making, right, on good days, 1,000 rupees, you know, 800 rupees. Today, they at least make, you know, 2,000 rupees per se, right? So what it has done, one, it has brought down the cost of access. At the same time, it has created more jobs, right? More number of things that people could do. So what we see is that with AI getting inside, you know, so by 2030, most of us will have either, you know, practically digital twin of everything, right? So digital twin of ourselves, as well as the things that you see around, right? The sofa will also have a digital twin. Uh, not that I would like to sit there, but yeah, it's, it's, it's kind of interesting, but that's the way the world is going. So this digital twin would actually allow, you know, you to get profiled much better and you could actually get more jobs, opportunities. Like, you know, you may be doing something here, but maybe there is a better opportunity somewhere in Australia, but you, you don't even know whether there's something there, right? And, and the second aspect is that bridging the gap, right? So, so if you can, without migrating to Australia, can you do the job from here, right? And a lot of us, how many of you have been doing remote work from home? Exactly, right? You're able to do remote work from home because the work that you're doing can be digitized, right? But, you know, uh, a driver, you know, probably can't do the work uh, in US yet, right? Or, you know, he or she can't drive the car in Australia, right, yet. So that's an area that we've been working on. How do we digitize physical work and enable it to get access by people without the need of migration? And we feel that that is going to unlock the next, I mean, the, the kind of jobs that we have not seen before, right? You could be watching a kid uh, in New York, uh, you know, a nanny could be watching a kid in New York out of maybe uh, 
nearby town from Bangalore, right? And and that is not very far. Uh, and we see that that's a kind of um, approach India can take, right? Um, because we have what what I call a supermarket of problems, right? We have all kinds of problems, right? We have problems in air, water, uh, traffic, uh, health, uh, uh, banking. So so AI needs like like we need food we just had. AI needs data to grow, you know, better, uh, more robust. So so if you if you throw a lot of problem data, you know, so so I know that uh, Elon Musk for sure can't build the car that will work in Bangalore, right? I know Tesla, the day get introduced with, uh, you know, full cell drive, it will get stuck in silk board, like many others, of course. Uh, I, I know that, but if I if I have a car or autonomous car, which will work in Bangalore, of course, it's gonna work in US, it's gonna be working in Europe, because, you know, it has already solved more complexity here in India. And I've seen this with my some of my portfolio companies, I funded 14 companies in AI space. Uh, one of the companies is Locus, which is applying AI to logistics. And they started with Bangalore, and uh, and then of course in Bangalore you have funny things, right? You like you you have one ways on uh, on the other side. I mean you have right hand drive, left hand drive. Both the sides are represented in Bangalore, and uh, you know when they when they grew out of that, they were doing it for you know big basket and stuff. So if you ordered, you know, or, or um, blue dart, yeah. but it was very interesting. Um, you know, I was visiting Switzerland and. Uh, I was actually meeting the Swiss Post guys, and they told me very proudly that they're using an Indian company to deliver, you know, Swiss Post uh, physically. And uh, that company turned out to be Locus because they said that it beat out everybody else, right? And it was very interesting because if we have supermarket of problems, we have variety of data with which to train the AI, right? That means that it will get robust much more quickly. And if it can work in India, it will work everywhere, right? That means that uh, if we have uh, talent thrown at these supermarket of problems and desperation to adopt it, we could become uh, AI leader, especially in areas which are more to do with the developing world, you know, where we're talking about remote jobs, how can you work uh, remotely work, how do you enable work. So those are the interesting things that are possible out of India. And um, so I work very closely with Neeti. Neeti came out with an India's AI strategy. And while it hasn't been much talked about, uh, it has been working very silently uh, to build this India's idea to impact innovation engine with one and a half billion dollars of investment that's proposed. Half a billion is through. So it's very interesting. So there are these 25 hubs uh, along with each of the IITs and um, they are connected to a research park that has been set up. And uh, then we are building these venture studios and venture fund alongside it. So you could actually take an idea uh, which is validated by research and convert into product in companies. So this is something which is being at work. Uh, it's almost two years now, and some interesting things are starting to come out. And I would love to take you through some of them. And it started with a broad thought, like you know, can we enable mobility, healthcare, and education? Three fundamental things, right? Uh, for less than hundred dollars per month for one billion people by 2030. Okay. Because if I if I look at universal basic income, and of course it got gets talked about a lot, right? It's going to bankrupt nations today, right? The costs are way higher than you can support it with taxes, right? But imagine if India hits ten trillion dollars by 2030, right? You're taxing people 20% on an average, uh, and you, that leaves you two trillion dollars, right? If you if you can bring the cost of access to mobility, healthcare, and education, uh, uh, you know, hundred dollars per month that practically translates to less than $2 trillion. So it is possible, but these are very hard benchmarks. So we started working on solving, you know, some of these problems, right? So three major areas, connecting then connected digitally and physically. How do you connect people, right? If you don't connect them digitally or physically, you can't unlock the, their potential. Second is you know, universal healthcare. And I think uh, COVID has just driven that home, right? Like it's not that, you know, you are well, but if you're, you know, made is sick, you know, you're gonna get sick, right? So everybody needs to have some basic access to healthcare. It's fundamental. And at a cost which, you know, the nation can afford. Third is universal access to education and financial inclusion. Education allows people to grow the human brain, right? So unlike machines that we are building, which actually have some upside potential, human brain has 
no upside potential right it can practically go anywhere right and if we can you know build in a capability to weather these financial inclusion uh, in a way that it, they can weather these shocks right that covid and other things they will not only live well but they will be staying healthy they will be um, learning to learn and learning to create and with the digital and physical connectivity they could connect to the whole world and get work to them right rather than them migrating to work what could come to them so with that we started building things and it's been very interesting and of course some of this is still in works but uh, it's very very critical because if you think about it by 2030 we're going to have 1 billion digital nomads right which are going to live somewhere and work somewhere else right and it's not just digital work but also today you know things which are physical in nature and we've been building the infrastructure so that means that how do you get you know 5g level uh, low latency level connectivity to the rural areas so we've been building hard at work you know technologies on uh, to enable that uh, this is an interesting one uh, we've been of course playing around with this and this is the first version we we call it you know tp1 but it's an interesting robot which allows you to attend meetings remotely right and and this is the first version which means that you know um, uh, there is another one which has arms and uh, you can manipulate things uh, remotely uh, so like we built this uh, avatar nurse and uh, we manipulated it from india uh, you know the nurse being in 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 florida in us right and it was very interesting because we could see that okay you know maybe a, a nurse in kerala can attend to patients aging patients in japan right and uh, and it's very interesting so by the way this is an interesting fun robot uh, you know you can attend meetings uh, because we saw that um, you know when you are actually uh, online uh, and you are engaging with the world which is offline there is a huge gap right you don't have the same understanding of the social context so we built uh, first a robot which could understand social con uh, context and uh, uh, enable more things to happen so of course this is early um, if you want to work with us you know drop us a note would love to uh, take in your feedback you can come over we can demo this for you of course right now it can only carry samosa and probably a, a person in avatar form uh, but yeah hopefully uh, some interesting things will come uh, this is the the this is the nurse that we built and we took it it was an x prize competition uh, we went up to semi finals and uh, couldn't nail the semi final because the judge was using the vr headset you know she felt uneasy because we are still not there yet right so these technologies are building up but it's an interesting video that i would love to show i wish there was sound uh, because a lot of videos and uh, you know we could have actually uh, put that across um, so this is this is an interesting company it's a run by a friend of mine called robert fock it's a company called enride uh, they operate out of uh, stockholm and uh, they have these huge trucks so you know in in stockholm you know uh, north of stockholm Uh, you have lot of uh, logging industries right and if 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 anyone if you have gone to ha has anybody gone to nordics i survived a winter you know it's it's really hard it's minus uh, you know 30 40 50 <laughs> it's hard right so you can't you, you don't get uh, you know truck operators which can operate there so it's a very interesting one they build this uh, truck and uh, there is no place for any driver to sit so they can actually have more logs uh, you know that can come in and uh, it gets tele operated that means there is a uh, there is a driver who's sitting in a nice cozy warm environment and you know she's operating the truck okay uh, and we have done also similar experiments in india and uh, uh, we are now uh, you know uh, <clears throat> trying to collaborate with them as well but it's very interesting right like uh, imagine uh, today it's linda but like it could be uh, ram kishan over you know wants to go from anywhere uh, it could be uh, some of the women who might be uh, you know interested in driving around these huge trucks right uh, which is typically been a very male dominated profession so what is also going to happen is that a lot of these livelihoods once uh, just like it and bpo right they kind of like opened up to a large society uh, you know practically getting participation from everyone this uh, you know converting physical task into digital realm will allow for more equal participation in the workforce and uh, and what we have seen is that that's actually very important 
80% of the healthcare will be delivered outside of the hospitals by 2030, right? So today they don't recognize you unless you're sick, right? You can't be a patient without being a patient, right? You have to be patient. Um, but yes, so that's the truth. But if, if, if I have to bring the cost of the healthcare down, I have to practically keep everybody out of the hospitals, right? Um, and that is so fundamental. So we, in fact, we tried this interesting experiment called X-ray Setu, uh, which was built during this COVID wave too, when people were dying left, right, and center. And um, unfortunately, a lot of people in my network also lost their parents, uh, friends, families, because we did not had enough radiologists who could look at their reports. So you typically got to know about the lung health really late, right? I know somebody personally who, uh, you know, if the, his report or, uh, would have come four hours earlier, he might have been saved, but he died, right? So, so this was very interesting. We built this tool. So, so anybody in from anywhere can take a picture of the X-ray, you know, send it to us via this WhatsApp chat bot, and we will deliver the results to them. We will tell them whether you know you need to look at it more deeply. We built it for doctors, and uh, we just threw it out. And it, we were so surprised. It got used by more than ten thousand doctors and X-ray technicians. People, there was a X-ray technicians. We called them up. Uh, uh, he was in Baramati Taluka, right? And uh, he, and we asked him like, what what we could have done better? He said that you should have just pushed this two weeks earlier. We could have saved so many lives, because their radiologist comes every two weeks, once every two weeks. He said so many people could not be assessed, and by the time they got assessed, their lungs were so bad that they could not be you know recuperate. They could not recuperate. So this is interesting. By the way, it also got used across 28 countries, which we were very surprised because it was a WhatsApp chatbot and anybody could send a picture. And, uh, and that also showed us. And when we, when we started digging deeper, we realized there are 14 nations in Africa which have zero radiologists. And we realized that if you build this kind of solution and take it, make it accessible to people, not only in India, but you know, in Africa, other places people could use it. The third one is about looking at how do we enable 300 million human brains that we actually have got at our disposal. There is no other country in the world which has got 300 million brains, which are young. That means that with the right kind of mentoring and guidance, they can practically go anywhere, right? And of course, that means that they can go on the other side as well. Uh, so that's where we started looking deeper into it. And we realized that while we are putting a lot of probes in machine learning and how machines are learning, we haven't actually taken the same hard approach to human learning. We just put these kids in schools and hope that they learn. Unfortunately, that's not really true. Uh, there was a recent report that came out in Economist and I was actually going through it. Um, so school closure did not have much effect in the developing world. Now that was like really interesting and I looked deeper into it. The deeper I looked into it, I realized that they are saying that because even when they had the schools on, it wasn't making too much of a difference. That means that schools have been so pathetic at imparting human brains, the learning environment they need to be nurtured. So we're working very closely with University of Alto, Finland, um, uh, Indian Institute of Science, and a whole bunch of researchers across the globe to actually investigate human learning and take in lessons from what we have seen scales really well with machines. Because in machines, we can put probes, right? So we've seen the self-learning works really well, right? So if I just let the algorithm roam among data, it picks up stuff, okay? And it learns really fast. Machines learn from, you know, uh, with GANs, genetic adversarial networks. That's the fastest way for us to train any machines because it, it uses very less data. And we said, what's the equivalent of human beings? It's peer learning, monkey see, monkey do. So we said, okay, why don't we have peer learning in our schools? Because, you know, when you go to a classroom, you know, the teacher tells you not to talk to the next person, right? If you talk, then you're thrown out. Then you become outstanding student. So we said, okay, why don't we bring that in? We can make it mainstream. So we redesigned the classroom and you can see on the right hand side, it allows for experiencing new things, exploring the solutions and then building them, creating them. And they could be creating digital, or physical in nature. So this is actually going to be live this month. Um, so this is a fully built up space. And uh, this is in, this is the new kind of classrooms that we are suggesting to government. Uh, you know, if, if you have people in 
schooling ecosystems you know we are going to make it open source adopt it but this is the kind of you know classroom that will actually fully optimize human beings for learning i mean i hate to say that it sounds so cliche but it's not been done so because we have not looked at it hard enough so if i look at it if we are able to connect digitally or physically if we are able to allow you know healthcare to be accessible to everyone with much lower cost and enable them with education and financial inclusion we could have universal basic income which will allow you to be free and that is what would lead to this massive shift which we feel ai will eventually bring freeing you so can so that you don't have to work under external compulsion right external compulsion is that i ask you to do a job right versus you doing work to express yourself so with that thought i will actually you know um how do we actually shift uh, this fundamental nature and the way we see is that by putting you know access to easy resources in terms of ai and robotics